things distinct? In particular, on two directions, I'll talk about this. First, we're trying to go multi-scale, meaning we're trying to extract and identify states, latent states that can simultaneously describe the dynamics across spatial temporal scales. And then I'll talk about a novel methodology we've developed to try to dissociate those dynamics from your neural data that are actually behaviorally relevant. So let's first go multi-scale. So the motivation here for us was that we know that behavior, especially naturalistic behavior, is likely reflected in both small scale and large scale network dynamics. So we can actually measure these various scales using different neural signal modalities, like for example, spiking activity of a population of neurons can give you one scale, and local field potential can give you a larger network level scale. So the question is, can we actually model all of these scales simultaneously within our dynamical models to try to understand how they explain behavior? Now, from a modeling perspective, this is difficult because these signals, of course, have very different statistical distributions and time scales. For example, on the side of spikes, you have these binary time series with a millisecond time scale, whereas local field potentials or ECOG are these continuous signals that have slower time scales. And indeed, it's important to take this into account, even from just a decoding accuracy perspective. So a couple years back, we built just a simple representational model of just spikes, and we showed that if you take into account the binary and the fast time scale of the spikes, you can do much better decoding. So it's actually important even for a representational model, and I would argue if you want to understand behavior, it's even more important. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to build a multi-scale dynamical model that would tell us how brain state is simultaneously represented in field potentials as well as spikes. This is work by two of my students, Solarap Bospor and Hanlin Shea. So basically, this is the model structure. You have the latent brain state that has some dynamics that you model. You have your field potential activity that is a function of that. And then you have uh, your, now you have your binary spikes. So up the first two lines are basically your typical LDS models. And now we have the spike scale that we model as a point process, fully specified by the firing rate function. And now the question is for this model structure, how do we learn the parameters? How do we build inference algorithms and estimation algorithms? And then how do we use it to study behavior? So first, uh, my student developed a multi-scale uh, Bayesian filter that can run at multiple time scales and extract information across scales to decode that latent state. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but for those of you who are familiar with filtering, the prediction step is just like your common filter, but once you do the derivation in the update, you're making correction both based on, based on spikes and based on field potential. So this is, in a sense, generalization of common and point process filters. Okay, great, we have an inference algorithm. What's next? Let's fit the parameters. So given the inference algorithm, now we can develop an unsupervised multi-scale expectation maximization algorithm that can actually fit these parameters. Again, I'm not gonna go into the math, um, mathematics, but basically in the expectation step, you would use a multi-scale filter to do expect, expect, get the expected values, and then maximization has a little bit of numerical uh, optimization involved. All right, so now we have an inference algorithm. We have an unsupervised learning algorithm. So let's now use these models to study how multi-scale dynamics explain naturalistic rich and grass movements. That was our goal. So we are very lucky that we're collaborating with Bijan Pesaron's lab, has this beautiful data set of monkeys performing these naturalistic rich and grass movements. So basically there's an object that's manually moved by an experimenter in, an, in a wide area in 3D space. There's no trial structure or time constraints or anything like that. So the monkey just naturalistically decides to reach for the object as it wishes, grasp it, bring it back, and then whenever he wants, he will go again and reach and grasp the object. So while they're doing this naturalistic task, we're recording the major joint angles, the 27 joint angles, and also simultaneously recording spike and LFB activity across over 100 channels. So the questions we're trying to answer are how large scale and small scale dynamics explain this naturalistic rich and grass behavior. Small scale are those, for example, in spikes, and large scale are in local field potentials, for example. So first, we want to know how these dynamics they relate to each other, and also how they relate to behavior. So the good thing is, now that we have our learning algorithm and we can learn this model to study the dynamics, all you have to do is look at this first line. 
And in particular, if you look at the eigenvalue of this transition, uh, the, the transition matrix, so basically that tells you how you go from time t minus 1 to time t. The radius of this complex conjugate eigenvalues will tell you the time decay in your dynamics. So how fast does your dynamic decay in response to an impulse excitation? The uh, angle will tell you the oscillation frequency. So with what frequency does your dynamics oscillate in time in response to an impulse excitation? If you look at each eigenvalue pair, so complex conjugate pair, each corresponds to a unique pair of decay and oscillation frequency, and if you look at all of them, they describe the dynamics. So we call each of these a dynamical mode uh, that corresponds to one time decay, one oscillation frequency. All right, so what do we do? We want to attract these dynamical modes. We, we use our EM algorithm. We uh, extract the A matrix. We get its eigenvalues. Then what we want also is to relate these modes to behavior, right? So what we do is we perform a similarity transform to write x in a modal form. And all you need to know if you're not familiar with this is that in modal form, you can actually write the state in a way that you can associate each dimension uniquely to an eigenvalue. So each dimension, so the blue, the pink, and the green, correspond to one decay oscillation frequency. And if I decode with them, I know how predictable behavior that mode is. So that's, that's, that's a nice part about it. All right, so before we do this, we want to make sure that we are not fooled by noise or model misidentification. So our argument was we want to find modes that are principally present or persistently present in our neural data. And those modes, we argued, should appear at some latent state dimension and always be there if you even increase the state dimension. So regardless of the latent state dimension, which is kind of an abstract quantity, right? It doesn't really have a physical dimension. It should be there if it's real. So we construct this eigenvalue dimension diagram. So on the x, y axis, you have the imaginary and real component of the eigenvalues. On the z axis, you have the dimension. So at each dimension, I fit one model, I sweep the dimension, and get all of the eigenvalues. Now what I'm looking for are these vertical clusters of eigenvalues that persist across dimensions, show up at some point, never go away. And I call those principal modes. And that's really the subject of analysis here. OK, so let's look at the data now. We first looked at single scales on their own. So we first just looked at spiking activity, for example and looked at the mode. So you can see that you see this beautiful condensed vertical clusters of complex conjugate modes that show up in spikes. This is a top view on the real imaginary plane. We also did the decoding. And what you can see is that these modes have variable decoding of behavior. There exists one mode that's quite dominant in terms of predicting behavior compared to every other mode. Let's look at LFB now. Similar thing, so you have these vertical clusters that show up, and these are of course different from spikes as you would expect, but again, there's one mode cluster that's dominantly predictive of behavior. So let's put them together. So you can see they have different modes, of course. These are different scales. But it seems that the behavior predictive mode is at a very similar location in LFB and spike, meaning a similar decay and oscillation frequency. Now, the first thing we have to address is that this is not trivial. Because, for example, if your behavior has that dynamical mode prevalent in it, then it could just, through a just simple representation, you will see it in both spikes and LFBs. So what we did was we looked at the modes in behavior joint angles. And you can see that the modes have a very wide range of frequency uh, eigenvalues, and this is the neural mode. So this is not simply a ref replicate of behavior modes, and indeed, the time decay in your behavior is much slower, and the frequency range is wider. Now, this seems to imply that there exists this mode that's shared across scales, meaning it's multi-scale, and is explaining behavior. We said, okay, if it's really true, then we should get further evidence by not building a multi-scale latent state model. If I do that, I should get an eigenvalue exactly again at that location, and that's what happened. So this is a converging evidence about the existence of this multi-scale mode. I want to emphasize, each of these three diagrams are constructed with different mathematical models, different time scales, different learning algorithms, and yet they both all produce the same mode, giving us converging evidence. Even across monkeys, we found the same multi-scale mode at the same location. So let's remind ourselves what the task was. 
This task is a naturalistic task. They're not cue, there's no go cue, there's no visual cue, they're not any time constraints. And it seems, therefore, in this naturalistic coordination of the arm and hand, this mode is actually a signature of this type of movement. Now, what we found, so you might ask me, what are the decay and the oscillation frequencies? We found that decay are about a second and a frequency of about 0.2 hertz. Now let's first talk about the decay. This decay was actually much slower or much larger meaning than the other non-predictive modes in the network, which were more transient. Now we, we found also that it wasn't just the decay that was impor important in explaining behavior, but also the frequency was quite important. Now, another question that might arise at this point for those of you who work on the motor stuff. So the frequency seems a, a little bit low. So you might say, why is it low? So this task, again, let's remind ourselves, this is a natural task where they're coordinating their arm and hand movement at their own will. We are not having a trial structure. So the movement's continuous in time. We're analyzing the whole session, the whole course of neural activity, continuous time. And therefore, this is very different from trial-based kind of analyses that uh, you've seen. And it seems to imply that for these naturalistic rich and grass movements, this is a frequency uh, that neurodynamics are organized around, and the decay is also about a second. All right, so that's what I wanted to talk about regarding the multi-scale aspect. Now, a separate direction in my lab which is very motivated by the fact that these dynamics are so important in explaining behavior is focused on developing new methods that can accurately dissociate those dynamics in neural data that are behaviorally relevant. So what do I mean by that? So let's think about trying to understand the dynamics underlying movements. You have usually some neural recordings that you're working on. You have some behavior measurements. Now, if you look at the brain states, not all of these brain states that are represented in your neural activity are related to your movements. They're also related to your emotions, how hungry or how thirsty you are. Similarly, if you look at the dynamics or the brain states that give rise to your behavior, it may be that some of your behavior dynamics actually are not encoded in your neural recordings. So if you want to study these data sets, what you really want is to extract those latent states that are behaviorally relevant and are common between behavior and neural activity. Now, can our common methods, standard methods, do this? So let's think about neural dynamic modeling, including the stuff that I've shown you thus far. These are unsupervised with respect to behavior, so they ignore behavior. And what happens is that they can actually learn behavior on related dynamics, so the red parts, that can confound or even mask your behaviorally relevant dynamics. Let's think about representational models. I would argue these are also dynamical. It's just that they ignore neural activity. And the dynamics they model are those dynamics in your behavior. Now, if you look at representational model, they may actually model behavior dynamics that are not in your neural activity. So the common, well, current dynamical modeling approaches actually cannot directly extract those behaviorally relevant dynamics. So we developed a new algorithm, PSID, that actually allows us to directly dissociate and model these behaviorally relevant neural dynamics and states. This is work by my student, Omid Sani. Um, so this is the model structure. <coughs> Again, you have a latent state, you have dynamics, you have neural signals, and you have behavior that is a function of this latent state. But what PSID allows you to do is to prioritize and first extract latent states that are behaviorally relevant. And it does so based on a projection of future behavior data on past neural activity. And the intuition is that this latent state should have information about future behavior, if it's behaviorally relevant, and if it's predictive and dynamical. Once you get these behaviorally relevant states, then you can uh, fit your uh, model uh, parameters. And if you're interested in a second separate stage, you can get the unrelated uh, dynamics as well. But the good thing is because you could prioritize the behaviorally relevant dynamics, you get a much lower dimension on compact representation. Now, for those of you who want to do, know a little bit more about the math, I'll spend like a few seconds on, on this, and I can go into more details later. So how do we do this? This is the model structure. So first stage is extract the, the green X, which is behaviorally relevant. This is our behavior and neural signals. So what do we do? 
we predict uh, future behavior from neural activity via projection. So based on your data, you can construct this projection matrix, empirically do the projection. Now theoretically also from your model, you can prove that this projection is some, some tall matrix times the behaviorally relevant latent state. And you can prove that the row, row, uh, row, uh, row space of these two match. So then what you can do is you can do an SVD, match the row space of the two, and therefore extract your green X. And then if you're interested, you can look at the residual and extract the rest. But I'm not gonna go into more details. All right, so what can we do with this? One question that's very important for all of us in neuroscience across domains is what's the dimension of behaviorally relevant neural dynamics? So we said, okay, let's lose NDM and PSID and RM to try to answer this question in this naturalistic reach and grasp movement task. So what we did was we used NDM, neural dynamic model, the unsupervised one, and sweep the state dimension, looked at decoding accuracy of behavior. We did the same with PSID. And we looked at what dimension does decoding saturate. It doesn't get better, so that's probably the dimension of behaviorally relevant dynamics. So what we found interestingly, that PSID reveals a much lower dimensionality for behaviorally relevant latent states or dynamics, four versus 12 to 30. And not only that, this four dimensional latent state is much more predictive of behavior compared to the state from NEM not only at the low dimensional regime that usually is of interest, but even compared to a much higher dimensional latent state from neural dynamical models and RM, meaning the peak decoding. This was for LFP and exactly the same results held for population spiking activity. Again, PSID revealed a markedly lower behaviorally relevant dynamical uh, dimension, five versus 25, much better decoding and more behaviorally relevant information, both at the low dimensional regime and even compared to high dimensional states. This was the case across all of the joint angles. It was the case across all the motor cortical regions that we looked at, so it was generalizable to different regions. So this was great. The second question that usually people try to answer with these kind of dynamical models is to do some visualization, right? So do interpretation and visualization by projecting the neural activity on low dimensional planes, usually like a two dimensional plane. So we said, okay, let's do this with NDM and PSID and see what we find that's different. So first, remember the task, reach, grasp, return, reach, grasp, return. So we did NDM and what we found during reach and return are these rotational dynamics. This is cool. This is a naturalistic movement. These are rotations that people see in all, across domains in modern neuroscience. But if you look at this, the direction of these rotations in reach and return are the same. Whereas your movement is changing direction, behavior is changing direction. So okay, let's look at NDM. So what do we find in two-dimensional uh, projections or using a two-dimensional latent state? We find rotations that change direction. This is much more conformant to what we would intuitively expect from what we see in behavior. So let's look at decoding accuracy using these latent states. Indeed, the two-dimensional latent state with PSID is much more predictive of behavior in cross-validation. And this gives us this notion of interpretability. By extracting those dynamics that are behaviorally relevant, you're allowing yourself to interpret these latent states in the context of the behavior that you're, um, that you're studying. Now, one cool question you might ask me is like, how is this possible? I mean, how could both these rotations exist in this high dimensional space? What is PSID doing that's different? So I'm going to show you a hypothetical example in 3D because that's all I can visualize. So let's say you have three neurons. In general, you have 100 dimensional space, but let's say you have three neurons. Um, and you wanna find a two dimensional representation. So you wanna project this three dimensional uh, dynamics into one plane. So if you project this on the y1, y2 plane, you will see rotations in the same direction. If you do it on y2, y3, you'll see rotations in opposite directions. So what this means is PSID within this high dimensional space is finding the projection that preserves behavior information. And by doing so gives you interpretable projection and visualization is much more predictive of behavior. We also check general, generality of this approach across different tasks, data types, brain regions. So we looked at, for example, a psychotic eye movement task 
uh, and LFU voltage activity, again, similar result. PSID found a much lower dimensionality for behaviorally relevant dynamics. Could do much better decoding of eye movements, meaning it extracted dynamics more accurately. All right, so to summarize, I showed you how we can go multi-scale with latent states. I showed you that there exist multi-scale dynamical modes that explain naturalistic behavior. And I showed you this new algorithm to dissociate behaviorally relevant dynamics and how it can allow you to find the true dimensionality of this manifold and find distinct and more predictive dynamics. Now, let's go back briefly to the, to the subject of interpretability. So how are these models interpretable? I'll raise two points here. Number one, by extracting behaviorally relevant dynamics, you're immediately allowing some interpretability with respect to the behavior using PSID. Number two, half of my lab works on control of these latent states. So our, 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 our idea is that if we can actually manipulate and control these latent states, we can actually interpret them better. So we've been developing input-output latent state dynamical models where we can have, for example, stimulation in the form of electrical or optogenetic stimulation. We've been developing novel kind of stimulation waveforms that are stochastic and allow us to do accurate machine learning for those dynamical systems. And we've been showing that in monkeys, both in monkeys and humans, we can have these models accurately predict the dynamics of neural activity in terms of latent state in response to a time varying stimulation. Now, how is this? Of course, this is a whole talk in its own. I'm not going to go into it. But what I want to argue is what, how this gives us interpretability. So let's say that you have this model. This ex explains how stimulation changes your neural activity or latent state. And you also know how those relate to behavior. So by having this whole transfer function from stimulation to behavior, you can manipulate the latent states and through that manipulate behavior. And by so doing, you're interpreting the meaning of those latent states. So I feel like in these two ways, both behavior relevance and control, you can provide some interpretability um, to, to these latent state-based models. So with that, I would like to thank my uh, lab members who do all the work and the funding sources, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. a lot of things when I reach that are not directly beyond. And you're either interested in those or you aren't. Yeah. So I just so you're defining a, whatever you need to decode that reaction. Uh, so let's say you're the, you're trying to study how movement uh, kinematics are generated from the motor cortex. So it's some measurable behavioral output. Now you might ask me, okay, so terse, maybe if I'm more thirsty, I'll make this movement faster. If I'm not thirsty, I will make this movement faster. So actually, you would capture those dynamics too, as long as that thirst state drove your, your kinematics in your movement. So if I'm thirsty, but my movement's not dictated by that thirst level, you throw out that part, because it's not really related to the behavior in any way. But if that motivational state actually motivated your behavior, like I move faster because I'm really, really thirsty, you will extract that because you have a measurement of that behavior that the third state also reflects in, and therefore you extract those dynamics. So by behavior relevant, I mean anything that relates to the measurable output uh, of, your, of, of this behavior that you're studying, let's say movement. Yes? Uh, I have a question about the So it's a measurement of the behavior you're trying to understand. So for me, it was the joint angles in my naturalistic reach and grasp movements. For the eye movement, the psychotic eye movement test, it was the position of the eye, so the eye movement. I don't know, if, if you have some other behavior and some other measurement of this and you want to understand how the brain generated this or how it, it brain activity explains it, you would basically take a measurement of whatever you're interested in studying and that would constitute your uh, behavior and you're trying to understand what dynamics in that measurement of behavior uh, exist in your neural activity. I actually have a quick question. Yeah, sorry. That, this is going to be the last question. <laughs> so so uh, I'm wondering, uh, so the behavior is very clear, right? The rich test or something. So when you collect the neural activity, do you um, only collect the area that people 
probably already know that it's gonna be associated with the behavior, you actually care about uh, some auto neurons that, that people might don't know, but like you try to learn whether it's- This is a beautiful question. So in this case, I showed you that even if I'm recording from motor cortical areas, motor cortical areas, you know encoding movements, I can still, I can still extract behaviorally relevant neural dynamics more accurately and with much lower latent state dimensions than MDM. You would argue that if you have states that have distributed representation, let's say mood or emotions, it's even more critical because as you beautifully stated, then these many, many brain regions are related to a lot of other things, probably much more behaviorally irrelevant dynamics. So it becomes even more, more important to be able to do this dissociation. But here we actually recorded from motor cortical areas. And even in this case, this was, uh, this was, uh, this was a very clear effect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank Let's you. thanks, um, Mariam again. Do we still have you, sir?